Good. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Amen. We're expecting a great time in the Lord today. Amen. Uh, Brother David, if you will, I'm going to get you to come up and just open us up with a word of prayer. And uh, amen. Let's just flow together in the spirit, folks. Amen. Amen. Well, Lord, we just... Lord, that we just <clears throat> turn our hearts to you, that we just take this moment to collectively gather together and to turn our hearts and our minds to you. For Lord, as we turn to you, you unveil to us yourself. You open up the heavens to us. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, we just, we don't, we don't want to do things by routine and by ritual, but we want to be actively and, and presently uh, uh, conscious about turning our hearts toward you. So, Lord, right now, we just, we just cease to consider every other thing. We forget all of the cares of the weak. We forget all that our body may be clamoring to us about. We just set our face like a flint toward you, Father. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. We look to you. Amen. Because we know that in you is life and light and all that there is that we could ever need. So, Lord, we just thank you again for this gathering. We thank you for the opportunity to come together. And, Lord, now we expect that you will do as you promise that you will manifest your presence in our midst. Yes. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Worship with us today. Hallelujah. I guess I'm going to... He's a glory and a lifter.
Jesus. We lift up our voice today. Yes. Hallelujah. To you, Lord. Break every yoke. Lord, yes. break every yoke in the yes. house yes. today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those that might be watching, Lord, break yes. every yoke. Yes. Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes.
for those that might be watching online. I don't know about you, but the days of just coming to have church because it's Sunday morning for me is over with. I don't care to do that anymore. We want God to move and meet every need in the house. Hallelujah. To do that, we've got to have the heavens broken. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We bless the Lord. We bless the Lord. The priest of the Lord need to arise in this hour. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, we bless you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. of our heart and our lives, everything that he's doing, he's in the process of changing us, our mindset, our mentality, our thought processes, everything about us is being dealt with in this hour. 
And let me just put it to you like this. With God, there's nothing untouchable. Amen? There's nothing untouchable that I see what the Lord's doing right now. Uh, Y'all can sit down for a second if you want to. I don't know what I'm going to do just yet, but I, I feel this to, to share this real quick. I, I don't know what God's going to do in this service today, and, and be honest with you, I don't really care. Just whatever He does is fine with me. <laughs> Glad to see everybody out today. But the Lord, I, I began to share some of this last night on the teachings, and it really touched my spirit. Uh, in a way as never before, uh, Romans 12, uh, you know, said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, uh, so forth and so on. But verse 2 was the, th the, the one that really hit me. He said, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the word conform there means to be like and act like and think like everybody else. Don't do that. Now, I realize the religious community, what they have done is they've said, okay, we, we can't wear makeup and we can't do our hair a certain way and we have to wear our dress, dress a certain length and blah, blah, blah. And they think that that is being different and that's not it because that, that same old man still sits in the temple. That same old carnal nature is still ruling and reigning no matter what the outward. And, you know, Jesus told them, he said, you're just a whited tomb. You, you, you know, you... Uh, you look okay on the outside, but inside, you know, you're full of dead man's bones. And so the Lord began to quicken me on that next part. He said, but be ye transformed. And we know that word in the Greek is metamorphosis. And how that, that, that has to do with a total 100% uh, a transformation. Every cell of your body, every thought process, everything about us is being changed. And how many knows that that is the hardest part about us? It, it, you know, we, 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 we change our clothes, we change jobs, we change houses, we change everything else. But our old nature is still that old, same old nature. And the way we view our thought processes, the way we try to deal with problems, the, it's always the same. Nothing ever changes. We might be a little smarter scripturally speaking, but that's really about the end of the matter. And my mind goes to John, the 11th chapter, whenever the Lord is speaking, uh, uh, you know, he, Lazarus had died and he finally shows up four days later and, 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 and Martha comes running out to meet him. And she said, well, Lord, if you'd have just been here and, and, and I want us to understand this is where we are. We're in that Martha mentality. We're friends with the Lord. We hang out with the Lord. We love when he's with us. We love what he has to say to us. We, we're even like Mary. We'll sit at his feet and we'll, we'll learn and glean from the wonderful life-giving nuggets that he gives us from time to time but inside there's been no change whatsoever inside there's nothing that has anything uh, uh, different well how do you know how do you know that nothing's changed see when we come together and the Lord is moving and there's a mighty uh, anointing in a service we'll all get caught up and we'll all get see things and hear things and know things but it's when we're under pressure that that old man begins to manifest himself and will revert back no matter how many you know, it reminds me of, we, we just come out of what they call the new year thing when everybody had the resolutions and everybody said, this year I'm going to, and this year I'm going to this, and I'm not going to do that. And we, we have all these things and we mean, we mean well, we really do. We mean well, but there's something inside the old man that when the pressure's on, we revert back to that old Adamic understanding that we always had. And the Lord said, what I'm doing right now, if you want to see creation set free, and let me just say this, in order for creation to be set free, it's got to start with this creation until we're not until we're set free i can't help you uh, and, and you know it goes it goes something like this is what the lord gave this to me some time ago and I, I i can identify with it so well i'm not necessarily guilty of what you're guilty of and vice versa you're not guilty of what i'm guilty of but it doesn't make either one of us free just because i'm not locked up in your jail cell don't mean i'm able to set you free we're just in adjoining cells <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And we're looking at each other through our, our bars. We're looking at it through our bars and say, bless God, uh, Brother David, if you just get this in your life straightened out, you'd be better. And all the time I'm holding on to my bars looking at you. I'm no free. I can't help you and you can't help me. Until I'm free, I cannot open your, your cell door. And the Lord is saying, what I'm doing with you, we're, we're talking about all of creation being set free. And God wants to do this and God wants to do that. And all the time we're bound up and we don't understand God is in the process 
of dealing with a priestly order long before anything can be done. I shared this a little bit last night of how that the high priest on the Day of Atonement, the Bible said he would go in and offer the sacrifice for the sins of all of Israel, and they would all uh, uh, be forgiven for one more year. And that was, that was they did that for a number of years. Uh, but I like what the Scripture said. The Scripture said before the high priest could go in, he first had to offer for himself then a sacrifice for the people of Israel. And what the Lord is saying is, before I can set anybody else free, I've got to be set free. God's got to deal with this priestly order. God's got to deal with what's going on in here before we can do anything. And I'm hearing the Lord saying, I'm in the process of transforming you so that your process is, 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 is you know, uh, 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 the world... The religious world, I say, has been a lot smarter than a lot of God's folks in this day and hour because they come up with the, the little bracelet and the T-shirt, the WWJD. Yes. What would Jesus do? Why? They recognize what I'm thinking ain't right, so I need to reexamine my thought process and see what would Jesus do. Well, let me put it to you like this. Take it a step further. If you have to ask, it's too late. You done missed the boat. God is looking for some people that have been changed so that my thought process is like his thought process. One of the analogies the Lord gave me, Brother David, years ago was this. When I was a kid growing up there in Dallas, uh, uh, me and my brothers and cousins and everybody, we were the ornery, normal, crazy young as, as most people are. Uh, uh, and we would do what they call play ball in the house. Well, my dad would come in and he'd say, son, don't play ball in the house. And so here's the deal. As long as my dad was in the house, I didn't play ball in the house. But if I thought he was gone, Paula, I would play ball in the house. And how many knows there was times I didn't think he was in the house, but he was. And like they say in the scripture, I bear in my body the marks. <laughs> Uh, hallelujah. Well, uh, how many knows there came a time years later, years later, there came a time I didn't play ball in the house. You know why? It wasn't my dad that changed. It was me. I was the one that grew up. I was the one that matured. My thought process has changed. And what, <clears throat> excuse me, when the Lord is saying to all of us, when he tells you to love your neighbors yourself, and he's giving you all of these things that we see as uh, commandments or laws or things. Why is he doing that? Because our, our maturity level is not to the point where it's a natural thing. When we mature to a place in God that we think like him, act like him, and we don't have to stop and think, oh, what would he do? What, what does God want me to do? When we react with the oneness of the Father, like Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't do anything unless I see him or hear him do it. I don't say anything unless he says it. See, there's a oneness that God is saying here, and that comes from that metamorphosis, from that change. The Bible says, going back to John 11, Jesus comes up there, and he tells uh, 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 Martha, Martha comes up to greet him, and, and you got to understand something. Their relationship was very close. They were very, very, very good friends. She comes up to him, and she said, Lord, if you'd have just been here, he wouldn't have died. I know. See, my mentality is I know him as the healer. I've watched him heal. I've watched him do this and I've watched him do that. I've watched him turn the water into wine. I, I've watched him feed the 5,000. I've watched him do all of this stuff. So I know he can do that. That's my thought process. And some of us, we look at our situation and we say, well, God can do this and this and this because I've seen him do it, but he can't do this because I've never seen him do it. And, and we, our minds, our thought process don't even go out that far. So here is Martha telling the Lord, if you'd have just been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, don't you know your brother will live again? And immediately, see the mindset. I want us to see, this is the way we think. Immediately, she put it out there. Yes, Lord, in that great day, that great resurrection day. He'll rise again. I got that. I got that, Lord. That, that's not what I'm talking about, Jesus. I'm talking about right here and now. If you'd have just been here, you could have saved him. But, but look what you've done. You've waited too long. Now we all got to wait for that great day, some glad morning, when this life is o'er. And so what the Lord is saying, he, Jesus said, what? He said, I'm changing your understanding. I want to show you something here. I'm the day. Amen. Amen. 
It's not a time spot on your calendar. We're always looking for something, and Jesus is changing our understanding to make us to understand that He is that resurrection. And when God begins to look, and, 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 and I know we got however many people in the room today and however many people watching by Facebook and so forth, I want us to understand that God is in the process of changing our thoughts, just like that song we were singing, Healing Wings, Give Us Your Flight. Change our mind from thoughts of death to pure life. See, we understand death because that's been in our nature. We understand death. And when you talk to people, we get a little gray-headed. We get a little old and tired and wrinkled and run down and ragged. And all we can think about is death, death, death. Yes, I'm glad morning. And God's going to this and God's going to that. And we don't understand. God says, I'm right here in the midst, right here, right now. I am life. I'm not going to be life. I am life. I'm not going to be the resurrection. I am the resurrection. I'm not going to be something. We're always putting, and now here's, here's where it gets tough on us. Because you see, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection, that put a responsibility on him. That put a responsibility on him. It's kind of like this, you know. I, I can tell you, someday, someday I'm going to be a millionaire, David. <laughs> Why? Because that puts it out in the future. If I want to lay around and watch TV all day, it's okay, because someday. But if I tell you I am, you know what? You're going to say, I want to see the proof. Let's see something that's, that, that backs up your claim. We, as the sons of the Most High God, as priests of the Lord, we're proclaiming things, and we're trying to put it out there somewhere, and we don't understand God saying, Priest of the Lord, it's time to arise. There's healing in our wings. There's life in our words and resurrection in our hearts, and we need to arise and let God speak through us and make us one with Him. And all these little petty things that hold us down, that divide us, that cause us to speak and see and understand only death. God says, I'm wanting to change that. I'm wanting to change that. I'm wanting to change your understanding. I want you to go through this metamorphosis. Amen. Yes. And, and everybody understands the, the analogy there about the, the caterpillar and the butterfly thing. We, we got that. And see what the part we don't understand. I mean, we get excited because, okay, we're, we're no longer the caterpillar. Now we're the butterfly. We, we got that. But the part, the process is what gets us. See, when that caterpillar goes through that process and becomes a butterfly, he is totally, completely alone. He, how many knows caterpillars and, and, and don't become butterflies in groups? <laughs> Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be great? Let's all get together and hold hands, and we'll get into our little communal uh, cocoon, <laughs> or whatever they call it. And then we'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Brother Dave, we're going to be all butterflies. But how many knows it don't work that way? And that's the part that's hard on us because, you see, whatever it is you're going through, you're going through it. I may not be. You're not going through what I'm going through. We're individually going through these things. And God says, it's because I'm transforming you every cell. When I get through with you, when I get through with you, you will not be able to recognize anything from your yesterdays. Amen. Not just the way you look, but the way you act, the way you think. Everything about us is going to be so changed. So that when, when uh, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll share with this, uh, uh, Bob and Bobby Jean are up in Detroit this weekend. Uh, <coughs> Matter of fact, I think Bob's going to be ministering this morning up there, so say a prayer for that church and Bob. But uh, Bob said when he went up there uh, back in uh, October, I believe it was, and his, his sister-in-law had passed away, and he went up there for that reason. And while he was there, uh, Bobby Jean's daughter was on, on her last uh, 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 legs there. She was in the process of shutting down and dying. And Bob had asked if, if he should come and just sit with the family and pray with them. And of course, they, they, they did. And Bob had no uh, 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 motive other than just to go and be with an old friend and, and to pray and, and so forth and be a strength if he could. And so to him, and, and, and this was his own words, to him, he was just walking into the hospital room. He was not going there to Shondai or, or, or doing all that cra you know religious stuff. He was just going to be with a friend. And yet... The glory of the Lord was upon him, and he didn't even know it. When he walked in the room, everybody in that hospital room saw the glory of God upon him and knew God had sent, in, sent him there for a reason. What has that got to do with anything? You, you, I may look at myself and not see anything. 
I may be just whatever it is I am, just a guy trying to get through life. But when the Spirit of the Lord has changed me, you'll be able to look at me and not see me, but you'll see the glory. That's where creation is groaning and travailing for. They're looking to see the Lord. You know, it reminds me, the Bible said Jesus took the disciples and he sent them out two by two. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm commissioning you. I want you to go out, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, do all of these wonderful, mighty works. And I believe they did that. I believe that's what they did because he sent them out. Well, shortly after that, uh, the Bible said that the Greeks came to a couple of the disciples the Greeks type and shadow of the world and uh, our creation. And, and I love what they said that, you know, they watched them do these miracles. They watched these, these disciples handpicked, chosen by the Lord. They watched them do whatever it was Jesus told them to do. But you know what they said, sir, we would see Jesus. Can I tell you something? It don't matter what anointing rests upon us. If you can't see the Lord in me, then I've not, I've not made it yet. If you look at me and you just see a preacher or a musician or a singer or a guy or whatever it is, I've missed the boat already. You need to look at me if you're in need of a touch from the Lord. If you need something changed in your life and you're looking to me, then what you need to look at me and say, hey, I see the Lord high and lifted up and his train is filling this house. Hallelujah. That's the thing I'm looking for, people. I'm crying out. I, I, I can't speak for anybody but myself but I'm crying out that God begin to raise up men and women in this hour that your agenda your 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 all of the stuff we've always held true to are being done away with as he changes us uh, uh fill us into his very likeness and image everything about us is being changed from glory to glory so that there's none of me that's left because I promise you the Bible says God will share his glory with no man amen that's the word of the Lord and guess what? He's not going to allow us to do anything so that when this transformation is done, we'll begin to stand up, Brother David, and we'll say, guess what? If I hadn't have prayed all night, God couldn't have done this. If I hadn't have studied my Bible and memorized the whole Old Testament, God could have not done this. No, God's going to do this in spite of all of our reaching out and all our religious efforts. Why? Because when it's done, we're going to be able to stand there and say, you know what? I've been consumed by the glory of God. There's nothing of me that's left. And for my ashes, He's going to give me beauty. Oh, hallelujah. I see the Lord beginning to cause us to understand we're trying our best to hold on uh, uh, to, to some of the last vestiges of things that we hold dear to our heart. God, I prayed. I went through a lot of hell to get where I am. Bless God. So I want God. God don't care about all that stuff. He's the one that caused you to come through it. And if there's some of you left in that hell, guess what? You ain't coming out. Oh, hello, walls. <laughs> so I didn't tune in to hear this today. No, what God's purpose is that we be consumed. See, the scripture says, our God is a consuming fire. And he said, this day, how many knows we're in the day of the Lord? Yeah. We're in the day of the Lord. It's not coming, it's here. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, and the day of the Lord shall try every man as by fire. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Everything that makes you up, body, soul, and spirit is going to be tried in the fire of God. And when he's done, the only thing that's left, the wood, hand, stubble will be burned up because that's everything that you are. And everything that's left will be him. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for that. I, I don't even know where all this come from. I didn't mean to get all, all this right here, David. But I, I tell you what, I'm ready for God to show up and show out and do some things. Hallelujah. Amen. Whatever your needs are in this room today or that, that may be watching by Facebook. Hallelujah. I just want you to know that God, amen, he's got some people he's been trying and working on. And I believe that we're about to see God do some, some mighty, mighty things. Hallelujah. You know. I know that, you know, we, uh, speaking for myself, I know you go back to the 40s and the 50s and even in some of the 60s, and some of you here will remember some of this. There was great healing campaigns and great deliverances and God did some mighty things. And, and, and yeah, he used the frailties of men and women to do some of those things. And so then we come into this greater revelation of what God wants to do. And it seems like we've dropped off a lot of stuff. Now we got his head knowledge and revelation. But can I tell you something? I believe that God is going to show forth His mighty power through these sons that have been tried by God. As He changes us into His very self-same image, I believe there's going to be a power of God, a life that's going to flow out of us like never before. Hallelujah. I just believe that. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know where that came from, but...
Let's just worship the Lord if we can for just a little bit here. <coughs> That's why I, here the last few days I've been singing that chorus. And, 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 and we've already started with it this morning. He's the glory and the lifter of my head. Amen. Uh, it's out of the book of Psalms. David was writing. He said, he's the glory and the lifter of my head. Amen. How many knows when you can't do anything else? There's, how, anybody know what I'm talking about? There's times you get so beat down, you just can't even hold your head up. He becomes the lifter of my head. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want us to sing that again. Healing wings. And when we get to the part, change our minds from thoughts of death. I want you to understand. I want you to hear that in a different light. Amen. Because I want him to change us. That, that's, as, as your mind is, as our mind is, so goes the rest of us. Hallelujah. If you believe you're defeated or you're down or you're this or you're that, that's pretty much what you are. You've already lived your life that way. But the Lord's saying, I'm going to change you. Well, hallelujah. something to share with us? Amen. Now, I got that over there for you if you need it.
has to do with paradoxes. Paradoxes in the way of the spirit. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I think I figured that out by now. Um, there are paradoxes or apparent paradoxes in the way of the spirit which is also referred to in the scriptures as a new and living way. Everyone look at your neighbor and say, new. new. It's, an, it's a new way. Guess what? That what that means is all these changes that Gary has been talking about, that the Spirit is bringing about in our lives, are because there is a new way. There's a new and living way Amen. for us to live. And, there, and Jesus, particularly, but throughout the scriptures, Jesus taught that there are paradoxes. And I, and I, I know what a paradox is, but I, I looked up the definition and I wrote it down because I really like it, so I'm going to read it to you. It says, a statement or proposition that despite sound or apparently sound reasoning, from acceptable premises leads to a conclusion that seems senseless, logically unacceptable, or self-contradictory. And I know that's a lot of kind of longer words, but paradoxes don't seem to make sense is what the idea is. They don't, it's not apparent that there's any good sense in, a, in the idea of a paradox. Some of, the, some of the paradoxes from the scripture, lose your life in order to find it. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Not to the natural man. Yeah. Yeah. In weakness, we're made, what? Strong. In humility, we will be, what? Exalted. Amen. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and in due time, he will exalt you. In slavery, or becoming a slave, we are made free. In scattering, we're made to increase. Remember the scripture that says, There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. Yes. The last shall be first. first. <laughs> Paul said, I'm crucified, nevertheless I live. And this is just, I just jotted down a few of the paradoxes that are in this new and living way. And, and here's a verse of scripture that's, that talks about this. It says, the natural man, how many of you know you're not a natural man anymore? Amen. That's right. I just want to affirm your identity in Christ. You, you were dead. The old man is dead. You are a new creation. Amen. Can I get a witness? Come on. Huh? We're a new creation. The problem is when we identify with and as and relate to the old way or the way that's prevalent around us in our culture and in our world, instead of relating to the, the new man, the new creation that the scripture declares that we are in him. That's when we run into problems. There's vestiges. There's old ways of thinking. How many of you know we're, we're sometimes a little bit creatures of habit? Hmm? Anything that you always do the same way? You know, a couple of times in our married life, my wife and I have switched sides on the bed. I don't mess with you. You roll off at first. <laughs> You know, I, I wore my watch, I'm right-handed, and I wear my watch on my left wrist, and I took for a while, it was the thing that the Lord was just teaching me, I took my watch off, and I wore it on my right wrist. Why? Just to exercise myself in being flexible and being willing to change. And, and, I, and I said, I'm gonna leave that, I'm gonna leave my watch on my right wrist until I stop looking at my left wrist. Because anytime I wondered what time it was, out of habit, yeah, yeah. I would just go like this. 
And it's interesting, um, as a music teacher, I used to teach this idea that I heard to my students, and, and, the, and, and what is a habit? Yeah, uh, this, is the, this is the definition I heard, and it was really enlightening to me. It said, it's when the body takes over for the mind. That's good. That's good. You don't even think about it. Yeah. You ever see somebody who, who bites their fingernails? Most of the time, they're not aware that they're doing it, but their body is doing it nevertheless. There are many things that we do out of uh, the body taking over for the mind. That's right. And so... Unfortunately, some of those things are old ways of doing things, even though we are not old creation. creation. We're not the old creation. We're not the old creatures anymore, but we've, we've habituated these, these patterns of behavior. Yeah. And so Jesus comes along and teaches us a new way to live, Amen. a new and living way yes. that, that is full of paradoxes or things that don't apparently uh, make any sense. So that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about. But it's interesting in that, that, that uh, I said, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. I'm not even sure if I read this. This is from 1 Corinthians 2.14, if you're taking notes. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, which means what? Which means you can receive the things of the Spirit of God. Amen. It says, for they are foolishness unto him. Have you ever done anything at the bequest of the Father that seemed foolish to people that don't know God, that don't know the ways of the Spirit? Their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Right. They're spiritually discerned or, or understood or known about. But earlier in that passage, in, in uh, verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world. What does it say? We Past tense, we have not received the spirit of the world, Amen. but the spirit which is of God. That's the spirit that we are of. That's your identity in Christ. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Everyone say the things. the things. There are some things, and I want to just emphasize that word. There are some things that God has uh, freely given to us. I looked up this phrase, the things, and it occurs 117 times in the scripture. The things. It's interesting. It's a, it's a real idea in the Bible, the things. The scripture says in another place, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And, and that's just a quotation from the Old Testament that says for them that wait for him. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and, and, and there's a, many stories in the scripture that we, could, that we could look at. But I want you to, if you have your Bible, turn, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And I'm going to read a few verses if you don't mind. You don't mind, do you? I'm going to read them anyway, so. <laughs> So I'm going to go a little bit quickly so we can cover some ground. So this is 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat. I want you to be thinking about yourself now in this story. That there are sometimes things that will come against us. And it says, to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself 
to seek the Lord. See, this was the key here. He realized there was a situation, an impossible situation, and it caused a reaction in him, which was fear. And so because he feared, mo many times when we fear, we get busy. Are you with me? We try to figure it out. We try to solve the problem. We try to overpower the enemy. We, we try to do this thing and that thing, and we begin to strive and struggle and strain, and we find ourselves in stress and all manner of things. But Jehoshaphat, it said, set himself to seek the Lord. Set himself. It, it, it means it's what he did before he sought the Lord. He positioned himself in order to be able to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? What was he saying by that? He was saying, you rule. Don't you rule? He was just, he was just, it, it's almost like uh, 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 saying, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's almost doing the same thing. And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave it, gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. This is a key. If you want to underline, if you write in your Bible or if you're making notes, this is a key. Just like it was that it said that Jehoshaphat in verse 3 set himself to seek the Lord. It said in verse 12, but our eyes are upon thee. Now you see that's a paradox right there. Because if you've got three nations that are coming against you. And they're more powerful than you are. The thing that would make sense would be somehow find an angle where you can escape or somehow find an advantage get up on a hill so you have an advantage even though they're more powerful than you but you can I don't know throw rocks down at them or whatever it is it, it doesn't make sense to put your eyes off of the enemy who's about to defeat you who's about to conquer you who's about to come and take your life that doesn't make any sense Amen. Amen. it's a paradox but they said, Our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon, listen to this. And I believe this verse 14 is as a result of what Jehoshaphat did and as a result of what the people did. And it said in 14, Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, and it goes on and lists this whole bunch of Hebrew names that I don't want to read. And it said, Then upon Jehaziel, came the Spirit of the Lord. Now listen, when you're in a trial, when you're in a situation, there's nothing better that can happen to you than that the Spirit of the Lord come upon you. And how did the Spirit of the Lord come up? They set themselves to seek Him. 
they turned their eyes on him and away from the problem. And the spirit of the Lord came into their midst. It didn't come to Jehoshaphat, it came to Jehaziel. And it said, came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation and he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Hmm? How many of you have been in a battle recently? See, I think we can engage the battle if we want to. God isn't going to stop us from getting out there and duking it out with the enemy. If we want to struggle, have you, has the Lord ever stopped you from struggling against your will? Usually not. Usually if I decide to struggle, I can struggle. Usually if I decide to get in fear, uh, he'll let me be afraid. If I start to stress out, if I start to try to figure it out, try to figure out a way to solve the problem, usually he'll just let me. But sometimes if we'll just learn that when we get into a situation that's like this, to just begin to turn to the Lord. How, how do you do that? You know, sometimes I turn to the Lord by turning on some preaching, Brother Gary. You know, if I'm, I'm kind of caught up in my own mind and my own thoughts and my own mess, sometimes I need, I just need something to kind of, something take my attention and let, you know, draw me into what you're saying, draw me into the spirit of, of, the, of the truth that's being declared by somebody else. Amen. Sometimes it might be going to prayer. Sometimes it might be reading the scripture. Sometimes it might be turning on some praise music. It might be any number of things. It might be taking a walk and just beginning to, 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 you know, pray in tongues or whatever it is. There might be a lot of different things that we do, but in essence, what we're doing is we're turning to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Listen, this may sound basic, but I heard Gary talk last night about we don't leave fundamentals behind. No. That's right. Fundamentals are always fundamental. They're always true. Yes, they are. We may leave some things behind, but we don't leave the principles of turning to God behind. We never leave that Amen. behind. Hmm? And you know what? I think it's time that some of us come out of struggles that, that, that are long standing. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> I think sometimes we start to assume, to assume an identity of struggling. Like this is the, just the who I am and the way my life is and so forth and so on. And you know what? If you choose that to be who you are, that's who you will be. As a man thinketh, so is he. Yes. Amen. How many of you know that we're more than conquerors in Christ? Yes, we are. We're more than conquerors. I can do what? All, All things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Amen. Amen. So Jehaziel is prophesying and saying, the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, now he gives, listen, now he gives specific instruction and insight and strategy. He didn't just say, y'all just sit here and I'll wipe them out. Wouldn't that be nice? But it didn't work that way. That wasn't what he asked them to do. Tomorrow, go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Go down, but I'm going to tell you where to go and what to do, but you're not going to need to fight. Set yourselves, stand ye still. Amen. That's not what you do in a battle. You don't stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. 
And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, see, this is also paradoxical, because we don't typically find people in uh, a situation where they are by far the underdog and are going to be overtaken by some enemy, whatever that may be, whatever your circumstance is, plug it in here. Whatever your condition is, whatever has come into your path that would seek to oppose you and overcome you, we don't normally begin to sing and to praise. Why? Because, don't you understand, back in the garden when Adam and Eve partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now their, their fate is set, as it were. God had told them what would happen. In the day that you eat thereof, in dying, the Hebrew says, you will die. Yeah. And so they were expelled from the garden, and that from then on, what are they trying to do, basically? What has the Adam kind of man been doing ever since that time. I'll tell you what, he's been trying to stay alive. Yeah. He's been trying to gather the good uh -huh. and repel the evil. Try. That's what Adam and Adam's kind has been doing from that day until now. But there's a different tree that God has called us to partake of. Amen. Not that one that's that's trying to, to, you know, well, I keep out, you know, people that are, imagine the security systems that Bill Gates has. Yeah. Imagine the technology he has access to. I remember years and years ago, I went on a trip to uh, New Orleans with my band students, and we were on a riverboat cruise, and there was a, there was a big vessel ship I don't know what you would call it and and the tour guide told us this belongs to Bill Gates for when he's in New Orleans and it's staffed with a staff of 10 people all the time just waiting for him if he's ever in New Orleans and I was just amazed by that because it was a big ship and there's 10 employees and I'm thinking man the resources that guy has really? and 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 the security team that he has all for what? So that no one, you know, abducts his child for, you know, yeah. for ransom or whatever it may be. And imagine the doctors that he has access to. He could, he could call any of the best doctors in the world. He could, he could have any treatments that he wants. He could have any tests that he wants. He could do all of those things. But you know what? It still doesn't work. Uh, who was the guy with Apple? Um, Steve Jobs. Imagine the resources that he had. Same kind of category of wealth, yeah. but when a sickness came into his body, there was he, he was defenseless. That's right. You see? I'm not happy about that for him. I'm just simply saying there is another way. Yes, sir. There is another way. And, and listen, if those people can't win doing it that way, yeah. we may as well just... We're not in that league. That's right. You know what I'm saying? We're not in that league. We don't have those kind of resources. So there has to be another way. And, ha and, and I'm grateful that he has shown us that way. I'm grateful that he's shown us that way. So let me see, where are we? And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments 
against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. What happened? I don't know. The Lord did something. Who can figure out how it all happened? I mean, I know it describes what happened. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. I, who knows what was happening? I don't know exactly what was happening. But God set something in place. God took care of the issue. Yes, did. Let me ask you a question. Has God ever taken care of something for you when you just turned it over? When you just look to him, when you just forsook all manner of methods to solve the problem and you just turned it over to God and you just began to seek his face and turn to him and sing and praise, that's paradoxical. But then God will do something. You see, the reason that God is speaking to me about this is because I began to struggle about something in my own life. Just this past week, you struggle, David? I've been known to. But you know what happened? I, some, somewhere in that struggle, I realized there's no point in this. Why am I struggling? I could sense that I was not at peace. And if I'm not at peace, there's something amiss. Something's wrong. And you know what I did? I turned on some preaching. And the preaching, in, in the preaching, and it, what the preaching wasn't really about, so much what I was dealing with at all, it was just, there was, a, there, was a, there was an idea in that message that just came alive to me. Amen. And it began to set me on this journey that says, listen, all that you think that you can accomplish by your own efforts, God, without any of your efforts, can bring you into a place far greater that you could never imagine. Right? Amen. I have not seen... Near, neither ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things. Turn to somebody and say, the things that he has prepared. But you know what sometimes we have to do? We have to sometimes wait in his presence. Yes, we do. And that doesn't always seem to make sense. Hmm? It's counterintuitive. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but... I don't like to sit around and wait. I've been going hard, I don't know, for my whole adult life. You know what I mean? I've been like hustling. I got five kids and, you know, I've been hustling and I know how to hustle. I know how to work hard. I know how to work from sun up until too late in the evening. You know what I mean? But the Gentiles know how to do that, too. Yeah, they do. you hear what I'm saying? That's just Joe down the street. No, that's not anything great to accomplish. There's a lot of people that know how to hustle. There's a lot of people that know how to work hard. There's a lot of people that can figure things out. But God has called us to a new and living way, a way that far supersedes that. He's called us into a day that's defined by completely different things. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I know it's new. It's new. Doesn't it sound new? Even though I'm sure you've heard a message something like this somewhere along the line. You must have. It's still new, isn't it? Because we still have a tendency because of the being creatures of habit. We still have a tendency to go the way of the world. Hmm? instead of just being still and waiting on God. You remember when the, the children of Israel came out of Egyptian bondage? Remember, God raised up Moses. I mean, it's a tremendous story. It's a tremendous story. God flat wore Moses out before he was even any good to him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He... Moses knew his history and he knew that God had raised him up as a deliverer and he tried to sort that out himself. That's why he killed the Egyptian who was oppressing his brother. I don't mean his brother, but his, his Hebrew brother. And then they found him out 
And he was like, I'm going to get in trouble. And he fled. And then he remained on the back side of the desert, Gary. Yes, he did. Everyone? For 40 <coughs> years. This is a guy who was raised up in Pharaoh's house. He wasn't just a Hebrew slave who's now in the back of the desert. He was raised up with the finest of everything, with the wealth of Egypt, with, with, with his sort of adopted granddaddy as the, the god of the earth, essentially. Raised up in the finest education, you know, you name it, the finest apparel, the finest food, and now he's on the backside of the desert. And I learned this from one of Brother Eby's writings, where the scripture says Moses was the most meek man on the earth, that the word meek there means worn out. Now that doesn't make any sense, does it? That's a paradox. The guy that you're gonna raise to deliver the Egyptian people out of, uh, the, the Hebrews out of the Egyptian bondage, you're gonna send him before Pharaoh? You don't wanna send a worn out person that's been on the backside of the desert for 40 years, out of culture, out of the mainstream, out of knowing what's going on. You, you, you would send the, the, the 40 year ago Moses. Yeah. That's the one you would send, isn't it? Yeah. The guy who knows the ways of the household of Pharaoh and knows, you know, knows all that. That's not the way God chose to do it. it he chose to wear him out. I'm going to wear you out. I'm going to strip all your ideas away from you until you learn that your strength is finite, but my strength is infinite. Amen. Good you see, that's, you see here, that's the thing. He's not asking us to accept something inferior. He's asking us, he's pleading with us to accept something that's so far superior that he, <laughs> that he would give up his son in order for us to have it. Come on. Yes, amen. Come on. Come on. Amen. Good word. Yes, amen. What he wants for us is so much better than what we want for ourselves, there's no comparison. Hmm? <laughs> We've tasted it. Haven't you tasted of it? Haven't you tasted of the goodness of God? Yes. How he's just poured blessing upon you? Man, I think on my life so many times, God has just blessed me without measure for no reason, for no apparent reason. And then sometimes I want to try to struggle and figure it out. I want to try to make it happen. Hustle. Let me just hustle hard enough. Yeah. Listen, you can't hustle hard enough. No. <laughs> and you know what that produces? Weariness is what it produces. God is speaking to us today. He's saying, look, there's a new and living way. Amen. I'm calling you up. Come on up here where, where it's different. You see, it didn't make sense for Jesus when they came to arrest him and Peter took out his sword. And Peter took his sword and cut off Malchus' ear. Yeah. What did Jesus say? He said, Peter, put your sword away. That didn't make any sense. Peter was defending him. These people were coming to arrest him unjustly. Yeah. That didn't make any sense. But, but Jesus says to Peter, Peter, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. And he took Malchus' ear and put it back and healed him. Amen. Hmm? It didn't make any sense for the Lord of life to die on a cross didn't make any sense the ultimate paradox but he knew because he had already declared to them destroy this tabernacle and in three days I'll raise it up hmm? the ultimate the ultimate we should know God's ways just by looking at his son hmm I, I, I hope that the way you're hearing this is not in a way of like bondage or command or like a law. 
but that that what you're seeing is the things that he has freely given to us can i read that verse of scripture again that i read earlier this is first corinthians 2 verse 12 now we have received not the spirit of the world everyone in here you've received a spirit but it's not the one that's operating in the neighbors you understand you have a different spirit in you it's going to guide you to do different things to act differently to speak differently to focus your attention differently now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of god that we might know that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You see, I'm, I'm afraid that we're still in a, in a legalistic mentality that we think God's not going to give me this because I was a bad boy this week. Hmm? Oh, you could hear a pin drop right now. That's okay. I've heard it, that sound before. I just preach right through it. Listen. How many of you know that when John saw Jesus, because he had, been on, he had been in the desert, he had been seeking God, and God had unveiled something to him, and when he saw Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Huh? The Lamb. Behold the Lamb, who taketh away, what? Who taketh away. And I want to ask you, did he do it? When Jesus said, It is finished, was it finished? I'm just asking. Was Jesus correct? Was he telling the truth or, or was he not telling the truth? It is finished. He took away the sin of the world. And therefore, you, in the sight of God, are under the blood. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It says the things that are freely given to us. You know, if I, if I give something to you, Lydia, if I say, Lydia... Here, I, I, and I wrap it up and put a bow on it and I give it to you. You're not going to take your wallet out. I hope. Yeah. I would be offended. You know, I give a gift sometimes to people unexpectedly and they say, you didn't have to do that. And I say, I know. That's what makes it fun. Right? Did you ever give a gift to someone and you got more joy than they did? Sometimes I would stop on the way home from work. And I would just stop at the mall. And my wife would call me and say, where are you? You're usually home by now. I said, well, don't ask too many questions right now. <laughs> and she would go, okay. She figured out after a while. And I would be in the mall. And I, I, would, I would be so happy because I would be there to buy my wife an outfit or a little piece of jewelry or something. You know what I mean? And, and I would have like a bag from, you know, her favorite, I don't know, loft or somewhere, you know, whatever. And something from uh, Brighton or whatever, you know what I'm talking about? A little bag in this hand, a little. And I'm walking down the mall, and I got a smile on as big as anything. People are probably thinking, that guy's weird. He's got stuff from women's stores, and he's all happy about it. And, and I come home, and they're all sitting down to dinner. And I, and I come in with a couple of bags, and I see my wife, and she sees the bags, and she gets a big smile on her face. And the kids are sitting there at dinner, and they see dad with a smile on his face and mom with a smile on her face, and they start smiling. And then, and then she starts opening things, right? And then I go, oh, you know, I think I left something in the car. You know, I'm just pulling her chain. I'm just trying to make it, I'm just trying to pile on. You know what I mean? Like, like, I just want to indulge her. Do you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Now, where do you think that comes from? I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from God. Because that's his nature. God is a giver. God so loved the, the world that he gave. God is a giver. And that's why the scripture says another one of those paradoxes, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Listen, I don't care what my wife might have bought me at the store that day. It's not going to do me as much good as what I bought and gave to her. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
And if she were to say, well, how much do I owe you? I would go, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, honey, I, I, I'm, I, I know that this week I said some things that weren't so nice to you. I'm not even thinking about that. What are you talking about? <laughs> Don't worry about that. I'm not worried about that. I love you. And I want you to have this freely. Now do you get the idea of what is being said here? See, we hear these scriptures so many times that it just kind of goes, skates right over our consciousness, and we don't really hear, because I'll tell you what, we've got so much false religion still hanging on in our mind that we think that if we're a bad boy this week that God's not going to bless us. God can't do anything but bless. He's a blesser. Huh? Didn't he say something about sweet water and, you know, bad water can't come out of the same source? Yeah. Something like that. I can't quote it exactly, but you know what I'm talking about. Blessing and cursing shouldn't come out of the same mouth. Remember? Yeah. Well, then what do you think? God, if God is telling us that, then what do you think he's doing? Let me tell you a, a little story. I don't, I don't think I've told you before. Maybe if I have, indulge me. My oldest son as kids sometimes do, was making decisions, and I was giving him input about those decisions. Dad, I don't want to keep working at the place where I'm working. I said, well, that's fine, son. Just go get yourself another job, and then put in your notice. <laughs> She's smiling, because she knows. She knows what's about to come. And he said, well, I got some money saved up. I said, you're going to burn through that money real fast. Just get the other job first. Go ahead and do it. Get out of that place, but get the other one first. So then his girlfriend's dad goes to the place where he worked. It was a restaurant. He's like, yeah, Matt, you got to get out of this place. And that's all he needed, just somebody to agree with him. And he put in his notice. And he told my wife, I was, I was gone on a business trip. I was in Ohio. I remember right where I was. I was in the car, heading to the hotel where I was staying, and she was telling me this, and I was, I was ripped off. You know what I mean, Gary? Like, wait a second, he won't even, you know, he's going to listen to somebody else's dad. That guy didn't change his diaper as far as I know. That guy didn't pay for his whole living, his whole time he was a child and everything, you know, everything, you know what I mean? I'm his dad, and he won't listen to me, and I'm getting in the elevator. I remember right where I was because it was so profound. And I'm thinking to myself, and I was just, I was just kind of upset and, and, and holding something against my son. And I said, he won't even listen to his own dad. And the Lord spoke to me, right? Isn't it amazing how God, sometimes you try to hear God, man, you can't hear God. A week, a month, you can't hear God. But sometimes God will speak right clear. You can hear it so clear. And the Lord just said to me, oh, he won't listen to his father, huh? <laughs> but you know, the interesting thing about the tone in his voice was this. It was not judgmental. He was just saying to me, I know how you feel. <laughs> and it was, it was loving. He said it in a loving way. Yeah. You know, like, like maybe my dad might have said in that circumstance to me, like, I know how you feel, son, when your son won't listen to you. I know how you feel. <laughs> and, it, and you know what? Instantly, you know what happened to me? The, that word of the Lord that came to me by the Spirit, it filled my heart with grace. Do you understand? And immediately, I was no longer upset with my son. You know what? My, my mind and my heart filled with understanding about where he is and love. That's the heart of the Father. You think God doesn't understand you and where you are and why you make the mistakes you make? You think he doesn't? That's why he gave the propitiation for sin. That's why Jesus was the lamb slain. When? From the where? From the foundation of the world. Are you hearing me? But we still want to make it about behavior. It's not about behavior. Your righteousness, by the way, is filthy rags to him. 
But here's the thing. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know, listen, this is the point I'm trying to get to, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Amen. He's given us his spirit. But we get, we get caught up out here in the world, and his spirit is intangible. His spirit is invisible. His, his spirit is, it, it doesn't make a sound uh, that your ear, ears can pick up. It makes a sound all right. It, 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 it can be seen all right, but not by the natural means. And so we get caught up out here in this realm, the outward realm, and we get caught up with all of the things that we think that we need to do to make our life better, not realizing we're just living like Adam, Amen. even though we're not Adam. Right. How many of you know you're not Adam? In Adam, all die. Come on. That's, your, that's the only hope for Adam. That's the only forecast for Adam. As in Adam, all die. Amen. Even so, in Christ, shall who? We're the reconciliation folks, people. We're the ones who believe this to the full extent. In Christ shall all be made alive. So where are you? Let me ask you. Where are you? You're not sure, are you? Let me tell you where you are. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. I know it's hard to believe because religion has sold us a bill of goods. False religion has sold us a bill of goods that we've got to earn it. We've got to be good Johnnies and Susies or God is not going to bless us. That's not the new covenant. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you with me on that? Well, whether you are or not, it's still the truth. That's not new covenant. That's old covenant. We don't need a whole message on how reconciliation works, do we? Because he has accomplished everything that brings about the reconciliation of the world. Well, as you might imagine... Let, let me just kind of quickly end here by reading a little bit more of this passage that we're in in, in Chronicles. In if this is verse 18. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. I did read this. And when he consulted, I, I read all this. I'm sorry, I read all that. He had set ambushments against them. Uh, let me see where I jump in. Verse 25, and when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. I know in our modern mentality, it's hard for us to understand a scene like this and, and, and get real excited about stripping dead bodies of things. But you got to understand it was in a different time. But the principle here is that if you set yourself to seek God, and you, and, and you don't fight, try to fight the battle for yourself, but let God do the work. He will overcome your enemies and, and, and bless you abundantly. That's the principle, okay? Can you get that? Amen. More than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. Are you hearing? This is just, don't you know the Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. You've heard that, I'm sure. Yeah. This is just an old covenant story. I could have read about the, the Exodus, or I could have read about when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream, and, and, and he gathered all the, all the wizards and the wise men and whatever, and he said, tell me, I, I forgot my dream. Tell me what it is and tell me what it means. Well, wait a minute, king. No, nobody asks that. That's too hard. Only the gods know that kind of thing, and they don't dwell on the earth with flesh. Well, you better, you better come up with it or you're all going to be killed. So, you know the story. Daniel gets the word of this. And what does he do? 
He doesn't try to escape. He doesn't try to figure out how to con Nebuchadnezzar. What does he do? He gets with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but, but they're Hebrew names, and, and they begin to seek God, right? Because they knew that in God was their answer. Not in the, not in the struggle, not in the, not in the danger, the imminent danger, and trying to sort that out and figure that out, but in turning to God. And then what happens? Daniel gets a vision, a night vision of what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was and what the interpretation was, and then he begins to act upon that. Amen. Right? It's all through the scripture, these paradoxes that don't seem to make any sense to the natural mind. They're foolishness to him. But God has not given us that spirit. He's given us another spirit that we may understand and know the things that he's freely given to us. Are you hearing me? This idea freed me this week. I got in a little struggle. And you know what? Fortunately, thankfully, God just had a, some minister preach a message and I just started listening to it and I got some I got a little nugget out of there and I began to go with that and I began to see what you're struggling for is nowhere near as great as what he will give you if you stop struggling Amen. are you with me yes. this is good news Amen. to me this is the gospel yes. this is good news yes. but forewarned you'll want to you'll want to fight the battle You'll want to get in the struggle. You'll want to engage it. You'll want to figure it out. You'll want to make it happen. You'll want to get, you, that's not the thing. What's the thing? Turn to the Lord. Set your face to seek the Lord. Wait on God. And man, that's hard to do. Remember what he said to the children of Israel? Stand still. There's the Red Sea in front of them and angry chariots and an angry Pharaoh all the plagues that those people brought upon Egypt, they're angry. And you're trapped. And, and the Lord says, stand still. That's it. Yeah. Woo, talk about counterintuitive. <laughs> you ever see these scenes of battle where they're having to wait till they can see the whites of their eyes, you know, and they would, you know, they would shoot and they had to wait till they wait and they're all sitting there and, and, and aimed. And here, come, here comes the enemy getting closer and closer and closer. And they're like, man, I, you know, I want to pull that trigger and they're like, no, 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 wait. Do you understand? That's what we, that's what happens to us. So hear the word of the Lord. Stand still. Be at rest in him. When you find yourself struggling, I promise you, you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> I had a dream once and I'll, I promise I'll end with this I went to I I think I told you I used to I used to struggle over the fact that uh, I was so busy and I couldn't dedicate myself to seeking the Lord I mean like hours a day and and so I would pray before I go to bed Lord just give me a dream just just speak to me tonight I'll, I'm gonna be asleep for eight hours so come and visit me send an angel to me wake me up give me a dream however you want to do it and you know what I prayed it every night. Every night I prayed the same thing. Here I am, Lord. Got eight hours. I'm all ears. And you know, the Lord started speaking to me. So one night I went to bed and I asked the Lord something specific. I said, Lord, I want you to show me what's happening. I thought he was going to show me something completely different than what he showed me. And you know what he, you know what he showed me in the dream? There was no scene in the dream. There, I didn't see anything. So you're like, how do you have a dream where you don't see anything? Well, like this. In the dream, I was divine. <gasps> Blame it on the dream if you must, <laughs> if that's too much for you to swallow. Don't make me quote where the scripture says we're made partakers of the divine nature. Don't make me quote that one, okay? But in the dream, I was divine. You say, how do you know? I don't know. I just knew it was a dream, you know? But here's the thing about being divine. There was no struggle, Gary, yeah. over anything. We call God the Almighty. We call him omnipotent, all-powerful. God doesn't struggle with the devil, does he? He doesn't struggle with darkness. He doesn't struggle with evil. There is nothing that opposes God, right? 
and we are his sons. He created us in his image, and through Christ, we're being made partakers of that same nature, okay? Is that enough theology to help you with this dream? Okay, so, but, but when I, in the dream, I was made to feel what it feels like to not struggle. And you know what? I had never, ever felt that before. The scripture talks about the liberty of the sons of God. I think I tasted a little bit of it. The liberty that you don't struggle against anything. And I woke up from the dream, and you know what? Immediately there was this stark contrast between how I felt in the dream and how I feel every day of my life. And, I, and, and, and for about two weeks, as the, dream, as the feeling of the dream wore off, I would say, I would find myself struggling and I would go, what are you doing? You're barking up the wrong tree. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're not supposed to partake of that tree. You're supposed to partake of the tree of life, Amen. which by the way is still being kept by the, 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 the cherub and the flaming sword Amen. who was placed in the way to, to keep the way of the tree of life. Oh yes, to keep a wrong mentality from accessing eternal life, a wrong identity, but also to keep the way, to keep the way. It's still, there's still a way to the tree of life. And I began to, I, I, and, 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 and you know, sure enough, what happened is the feeling went away and the comparison of struggling went away and you, know, you just get back into the vestiges of a former identity, the mindset of a former way of being, even though we're not that. So, if you find yourself struggling, it's the wrong tree. Feel free to remind me. <laughs> Do it nicely now. <laughs> Do it at the right moment. I'll try to do the same for you. I just want you to know, God loves you more than you think. Amen. Yes. Yes. <laughs> He's accounted for your every sidestep and mistake and error and willful, you know, he, he, he's already dealt with it. And he loves you. And he has made provision for us that we haven't yet even imagined. Maybe some answers for humanity's struggles are, are locked up in you and God has given it to you to bestow upon humanity. And we need to find ourselves in his spirit, able to receive that. Thank you. you know what the thought was that this brother shared? That Joseph had to be put in prison so that God would show him how to be still and, and, and tap into God. Because, you know, when he was a youngster, he was telling everybody about his dream and how everybody's going to bow down to him. And, you know, <laughs> you can imagine, can't you? to the point where his brothers wanted to kill him. God wore him out in prison. Everything, everywhere he went, he did the right thing. He never did anything wrong. And he ends up in prison. Right? But he could tap into something when the, when the, when the Pharaoh needed it. Right? And he, he had a strategy to save them all from the famine. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Like God gave him an actual strategy to save countless people, including the line through whom Jesus would come, right? Pretty amazing, all out of a prison experience. So if you feel like you're, God's got you in prison or you're stuck somewhere, don't feel that way, just look to him. Maybe, remember what he said to his brothers when, when he unveiled himself to them, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's it. That's it. We can't lose, folks. I'm telling you, we can't lose. Right. You can't lose. You can't lose, Gary. You can't lose, everybody. You can't lose. So stop worrying about it. You can't lose. <laughs> Amen.
Sunday, Bob and Bobby and Jean will still be up there. Mike's not be, on. Is Mike not on? Hello, hello. Yeah, I'll get this one then. Here we go. I'll just get this one. This one will work. Uh, I think they'll next Sunday they'll still be up in Detroit, but then they'll be back right after that. So, amen. Uh, all hearts and minds clear. I mean, how many, how many's had a good time today? It, it, it's been a good, it's been a good good visitation of the Lord. Amen. If you have an offering, here's the basket up here. Amen. And am I forgetting anything? Next uh, Saturday, you've you been enjoying the Bible study on Saturdays. It been making any sense? <laughs> Amen. We we uh, I, I will say this. We uh, as far as you know, I've studied and taught this for years. But this is the first time that uh, I've actually been able to go through the gate. The Lord's always teaching me. I stopped me outside the gate. He said, their minds ain't right. Their heart ain't right. We ain't going in. If you go in and mess with the ark, you're dead meat. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. But it, it, we're having, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with it. So I, I hope you're being blessed. Amen. So uh, until uh, next uh, Saturday night and Sunday morning, God bless you. Give the Lord a hand as we go off the air. Thanks, Devin. Appreciate it.